everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining me. It's Wednesday night, seven o'clock, our time for Zoom into wine. And tonight we're gonna talk about Burgundy. Um, and we're gonna do it with uh, uh, friends of uh, uh, wine, Zalto Wine Glasses. Um, now, not everybody um, got the wine glasses. We only had so many. And in fact, we sold every single one of our Burgundy Zaltos. They are very allocated. They're made by hand. Uh, and some of you that have them, I hope you really enjoy them. They're, you know, when, when you taste great wine with a great wine glass, it's like using a magnifying glass uh, to really enhance the information, whether it's the way your mouth receives the information, your eyes can see the wine, the way the wine responds to the shape of the glass. It is a, a real thing. Now, some people, you know, on the outside haven't experienced it yet, but if you want to really kind of just blow people away, put some great wine in a, a red plastic, you know, cup that you could buy from Costco, uh, you know, one of those big plastic red cups, try, try tasting wine in a cup like that, and then put it in a, you know, a typical a uh, high volume restaurant, $5 wine glass and taste it in there. It's huge difference between the plastic cup and an inexpensive wine glass. Then take it from that glass and put it into a high-end glass like what we're gonna use tonight, Zalto. And when you use, the, the, the problem might be though that the, the, it has to be the right type of glass for the wine. Um, a all purpose glass, which is, uh, like this, this is what I'll be using tonight. This is an AP, as they would call it, all purpose. They work really well, especially for small quantities of wine. Um, but you enhance it, take it up a step, a notch, when you really use the right tool for the right job. And the better wines really respond to the right singular purpose wine glass. And um, the Riedel family makes them. I'm friends with the Riedels. I love the Riedel wine glasses just as much as anything. Um, but I, I wanted to see what Zalto was about. Never worked with Zalto before. And um, I've been learning quite a bit about them. They are beautiful. Uh, Thomas, I saw you had one in your hand. Doesn't it feel special? Just the weight of it and the way it feels in your fingers. Wendy, what do you think? I'd love to hear your comments. If any of you else got your glasses? Let's take a picture. It's like a, it's like a work of art. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got my camera here. I want to take a picture of you holding up your Zaltos. There we go. Let me take go. my glasses off. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Two, one. Beauty. Wendy, what do you think? I love it. It's very delicate and feminine feeling to me. And yeah, like a piece of art. Oh, I... And that might be part of the attraction of the glass too, is that feminine, subtle uh, feeling. It doesn't feel like you're holding a jackhammer and you're really right. about to smell something that's equally delicate and subtle and almost kind of adjusts your brain frequencies to really you know, vibrate with the energy that the wine is putting off. Now, there are going to be skeptics that still just do not believe this, but you know, it does take a little passion to like wine. And when you amplify all that passion by all these little subtleties, it takes, takes it up a notch. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I think uh, the Zalto glass can do. Um, you know, they're not, they're not for the, the, you know, the everyday wine use. They are art and we're combining arts here, the art of glass, blowing glass and the art of tasting. So what I just want to do quickly and then we'll move into the tasting portion of our program. Is my designer did a good job on our logo. I was very proud of her. That is the glass that we're using tonight, the Zalto. Like I said, I sold every single one that we had and they are allocated. I actually have to order them very months in advance. They come in and they're kind of divided up by, by history and historics. Yeah, when the sales company says, oh, you usually get six, so we're going to get you six more. I, I I might get 12 this time. We've been increasing our allocation, if you will. But uh, <clears throat> let me just uh, take you into the, what, what they, how they make them so you can see. 
the actual work that goes into it. Of course, there's some mood music in the background. Let me uh, stop that from happening. Let's go again. The music was too big to talk over, <laughs> for sure. Um, but I hope you enjoyed a uh, look at how much work it goes into making this beautiful glass. Now we're gonna go straight into our uh, burgundy presentation tonight. And uh, I'm gonna be tasting them in a regular AP glass with you, but uh, I did have a, a chance to taste these at several points in time. Uh, I, when I put, put this program together, I wanted to show off you know, three kind of favorite wines that I have in inventory. Um, we don't have a lot of anything. When you buy Burgundy, you kind of get it by the case or two. Um, but uh, we are going to show you some really nice things. We're going to start off in Puny Montrachet, which when you look at uh, Burgundy, it's about an hour and a half south of Paris, right in the middle of the heart of France. Um, and uh, the monks have been... Uh, been farming this land for a thousand years and they really got to know the different sub areas. Can you hear me now? Any everybody? Can anybody hear me at all? Yeah, you're good now. All right. Was I was I quiet for a while in the beginning? Yes. Yes. Just before the just after the glass blowing. Interesting. That's, that's happened uh, before recently, and I don't know what to account for that. So if, if, let me know if I go out again, uh, but uh, we'll keep an eye on that. So uh, as I may or may not, you may not have heard me say, uh, you know, these wine glasses, hand blown, kind of have a, a passion behind them as well. We have passion, the glasses have passion, they set us up for this kind of delicate experience in tasting these beautiful wines. And uh, tonight we're going to start off with this wonderful Puni Montrachet, which is a, a white wine, a white wine region. This is a village level Puni, but the producer that we're working with farms some really good uh, and important vineyards. And um, and so they have, uh, I also have their Premier Crew on our website as well. And, uh, but when you're making Puini, you're making a small, singular, optimal spot for Chardonnay. And the monks that farm this land for long periods of time, op, they, I, they knew that this particular village, which is right next to Chassani Montrachet, and they both share the Grand Cru of Montrachet, um, that's what most of the villages in Burgundy are named after their Grand Cru. Montrachet is the Grand Cru. And um, that, you know, bottle of Montrachet in today's world is selling for astronomical amounts of money. Um, the Puini wines, you know, if you get a good Puini village level wine for anywhere around $100, you're in, a, in, the, in kind of the, the sweet spot, maybe 60, 70, 80 on the lower end and they go north from there. 
and the Puini Mont, the village, I'm sorry, the uh, Premier Cru wines start around 100, maybe 125, and quickly go north. And some of the producers get several hundred dollars even for a Premier Cru. And then uh, by the time you get to the Grand Cru, I haven't seen uh, a, a Montrachet wine of current vintage, like 2000, 2001, for less than $700 a bottle. And they, they are often several thousand dollars a bottle. Uh, for the most desirous, they can go for 10, 12, $20,000 per bottle. So uh, I don't think that's gonna be going down anytime soon. There's no more land to plant. Demand just only continues to increase. And the amount that the, these growers and producers can make is finite. So demand is exponential and the, and the quantity is finite. Uh, prices could go triple from here, but uh, not overnight. It's gonna take some things to happen and the world will continue to evolve with this wine region. Um, and uh, it's been it's been a nice run in the last ten years. Anyway, it may go flat for a little while, but then kind of level uh, level back up, and that's what I I predict. It's certainly taken a lot of ground, especially in these these moments right now. Um, the wine that we're tasting tonight, Jaman, is uh, a, 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 a producer that I have visited personally, and uh, uh, they are white wine specialist. I, I'm not sure if they even make red. Uh, I don't recall, but we, I went and tasted uh, and talked and did some barrel tasting with them of, of their Puini wines. I've supported their wines for many different uh, um, accounts that I've purchased wine for. Um, uh, they are very well-made, very good, very delicious, age-worthy. We're tasting a 2016 uh, right at uh, eight years old. It's still very youthful. Um, it has fantastic color, uh, nice gold has started to set in. The nose has got that wonderful plush um, pear, certainly a, a, a wonderful pear. And that apple is just kind of like, it's like a yellow skinned apple. And uh, the very pure, very focused. This is like the definition of what Chardonnay should uh, be, be compared to, taste like. Go ahead and taste that. If you're fortunate enough to taste it out of the Zalto, I think you'll receive a really subtle um, uh, levels of the, the, you know, feel that stony, like almost like wet stones, smell the stone, smell the, the limestone, you'll feel and taste all of the subtlety that is Burgundy. We're talking about wines that are made from 100% single varietal Chardonnay grown in chalky clay and um, um, limestone. And that's what that's what Queenie uh, uh, is all about. It rains there a lot, not uh, proper to water the grapes, they're looking for low yields, and they uh, there's a lot of producers that use a lot of different uh, techniques. Um, almost all their vineyards are, uh, well, all these vineyards definitely are hand harvested, um, and you can see them out there with their small buckets on their small vines with their small clusters. We're working with caviar, and this is kind of uh, kind of what we what we grow to expect from Great Burgundy. It's just a uh, and you can even see the soils, the, the, the ground, it's just white stones. And that's what you smell in the wine. $75 a bottle is a great value for 2016. I only have a few of them. Um, um, current vintages will probably uh, press $90. Um, I, I brought my own personal collection into the store when I started it. And these are some of the last bottles that we have. It was some of the old, the first wines we put on the website. So now as you're browsing the website, if you're looking at the catalog from uh, order in which they were posted, these, this might be the oldest wine on the website because this came out of my own library. Um, we are gonna move straight from wine number one into wine number two, unless you have any questions, comments. 
Ian, is there anything in California that you think, like I remember a few months ago, we, we were doing the liquid farm from uh, Santa Barbara County. Uh, if we were to put that in the glass next to this, how, how do you think that would compare? Uh, no disrespect to liquid farm. Uh, and I think if he were on the Zoom, he would, I would be able to say this. You can still tell, even with a producer that is you know, certainly respectful of terroirs, uh, of Burgundy's terroir, of you know, trying to make wines that are subtle like Burgundy, you can't, you can't really do it. Um, you can emulate, you can appreciate, you can be encouraged by, you can uh, do, do lots of things to try to simulate what Burgundy can do. But the, you know, the weather, the temperature, the ground, uh, the vines, the mentality um, is all in, a, in lock and step in Burgundy. It's the, it's the wisdom, it's the history, it's the winemakers. And they've, they've, uh, they've been able to respond to their growing area there. And the guys in, Bur in Santa Barbara, they're making the best damn Santa Barbara wines ever. They certainly are. And Jeff is part of you know, an elite set, the top of the food chain in Santa Barbara. And someday someone might taste a Santa Barbara wine next to a Burgundy and think of them as being on par in quality. And that may be the, be the case right now, but they are definitely still different. There's, um, you can smell a little bit more sunshine in the California wine. You can feel a little bit more acidity in the French wine. You can smell the that that stony notion in the in the French wine just a little bit more. Um, it's there's just those those things that you just can't take the Burgundy and lift it up and bring it into another zone. Um, and I'm I'm not so sure you even want to really get stuck trying uh, because Santa Barbara's great at making Santa Barbara Chardonnay and, uh, and uh, Santa Rita Hills. And some of the, now we're really appreciating some single vineyards. Those vineyards are 20 years old, 30 years old. Yeah. You're looking at Quinty Montrachet where they're a thousand years old. And there's just a little, di little bit of a different uh, uh, wisdom in those wines. And I believe that uh, we haven't even seen the best wines yet out of uh, Santa Barbara. So. Um, uh, while Jeff is part of the journey um, uh, and the inspiration is obvious, um, I, I still think that even the guys in Santa Barbara would agree with everything I'm saying and just the, you know, the, the kind of that, yeah, you know, we all have something to shoot for and we all have heroes that have given us hope and, and we look towards, and I'm sure all those Santa Barbara guys you know, think of certain wines that they tasted in their journeys that uh, are kind of shaping the, their 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 potential targets, and they may may ach achieve something very very close. Um, and that if I were to pick some Santa Barbara producers right now that uh, I uh, would you know look to to kind of be on par with some of the producers, I I, I there there's a long list. Uh, Santa Barbara has come, they've grown up so much and um, I'm really proud of a lot of these guys that I used to hang out with when they were barely even getting started. Didn't even have a brand yet, but maybe we're working in the wineries and it's been really fantastic to see how, how they've uh, responded. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and yet in Burgundy, there are thousands of producers and, uh, 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 we uh, would be lucky to be able to taste most of them um, or even a fraction of them in our lifetimes. Um, so uh, I'm just going to once again remind everybody, it's my life goal to retire here. I want to find um, a, a spot somewhere in Bone. And I want to be able to walk down the street, hopefully on, on with maybe a cane, it might be necessary how old I'm going to get. And I'll be able to walk down, get my little baguette and my little wheel of cheese, have my little wine, uh, sit in the park uh, and really enjoy uh, bone for what it is. It's pretty undisturbed up until now. And 
It appears to be a wonderful place. I love visiting there. If you haven't seen it, it's something to behold. It's just a really quaint stop. And you can take a TGV train from Paris and, and get right off in Bone and walk into the heart of Bone. It's fantastic. All right, seed planted. I'm going to continue as we go into our first red, which we don't have to go very far. Uh, we're right next to Shasani Montrachet. We're in Volnay, um, Berceau, Volnay. They kind of share the uh, a border. Uh, Volnay is a red wine appellation. If you're growing grapes um, that are white in Merceau, you, uh, I'm sorry, the white grapes, if, if they're in Volnay, you can call them Merceau and red grapes. Mare, so you cannot call them Volney, but uh, I think that uh, uh, Volney is a, a very particular, uh, elegant, softer, more delicate uh, appellation for, for Pinot Noir. Um, tonight we're tasting the Premier Cru uh, Clos de Chen. I'm going to go into the map, uh, take a look at that. And we're tasting Bernard Moreau, who I've also had the chance to visit. Um, uh, uh, see, 1982, so a newer brand um, uh, took over from his father. Uh, let's see, I, I'm not sure if his father was a brand before 82, he may have been, um, but the current generation uh, since 82, 40% of the vineyards are Chardonnay, 30 or Pinot. And I think that they have some Gamay vines in uh, Southern Burgundy and in, in the Beaujolais area. Um, everything is a state. And that's often the case with these Burgundians. They like to not just buy fruit, but they grow fruit, uh, grow their fruit and it's part of their work. And this is another differential between a lot of Santa Barbara brands and the Santa Barbara producers. These guys are as much farmers all day long and the, the wine is a byproduct of their farming. And so um, uh, you also they're kind of limited in their production as to how much land they have to farm. There's a lot of small teeny family farms um, I thought that this said total hectares here. Oh, eight. Yeah, that's uh, 16 acres. So we're talking about a pretty small uh, domain and a very good reputation. There's a couple of photos. Um, if you're there uh, at the right time of the year, you might see the Percheron horses. They are enormous. They... Um, I think they're similar in size to Clydesdales. They're just massive muscle, uh, muscular horses, and they pull the sled through the vineyards. Um, no machines, no oil, no, no nothing um, chemical going into the vineyards. I will, I will though pause for a second and tell you that um, young uh, Mandavi uh, recently got written up as he is. Uh, uh, I don't know if you would say patenting, uh, the, if it's a patent type of thing, but he's been involved in the creation of an electric uh, farming uh, tractor that uh, doesn't use any petroleum products and doesn't have any exhaust. Uh, so uh, something in the farming world that is going to take us up a, a couple of notches as labor and and also, uh, you know, the, the the expertise and the type of things that you can do with precision uh, will will only increase uh, with some more technology in that area. All right, uh, so we're with Bar Bernard Moreau. We're tasting the Volnay Clos de Chen. This is a 2017 vintage. Um, what I also liked about the wine lineup tonight is we are drinking 16s and 17s rather than 18s, 19s, 20s, or even 21s, uh, which are all pretty wonderful vintages, to be honest. There's no, there's not really a dud in the bunch. Um, 
but there are some challenges every year in Burgundy. So vintage plays a pretty big role in, in the Burgundian uh, story. Um, but we've had a kind of a run with 16, 17, 18, and some warmer vintages. And 16 and 17 were quite nice and made some beautiful wines. And that's that's what we're tasting here. Um, here's the Volnay Clos de la Chêne, Clos de Chêne, uh, sorry. Um, it is Premier Cru. It is 17. It's $120 a bottle on our site. Um, should probably be a few dollars more. Um, uh, the newer vintages would be 129, 139, and we have 17. So um, that's a good value, uh, $120. That is really nice. I hope those are potato chips. No, sorry, that's too loud, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was loud. Crackers. <laughs> Crackers. Good, 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 good. We are tape. We are doing this live, and it's raw and it's real. Um. So, uh, if you click, uh, like I just did through to the website, you can see uh, this is how we've got it written up. And um, John Gilman is a very good wine reviewer in the 2017 Claude de Chen, Claude de Chens, I keep wanting to put an L in there uh, from Domaine Moreau is another outstanding bottle in the making. The wine is properly uh, uh, still youthful on both the nose and the palate, but shows plenty of promise in the aromatic constellation of cassis, sweet blackberries, bitter chocolate, and complex base of soil tones, game bird, smoky top note. On the palate, the wine is deep, full-bodied, focused, and sappy at the core with excellent soil signature. Uh, fine focus and grip, silky tannins, and a long, beautiful balance that is still uh, primary, uh, quite primary in the finish. All this needs time to blossom. That review was probably taken uh, at the time of uh, the samples being issued. Here we are a couple of years later, and I think it's probably even better than that at this time. Uh, I want to show you, uh, just to kind of take you in a little bit. We didn't have any great pictures, um, but here's here's a nice little look at the map. I think I can even click on that. Can you see the map of that it popped up? Yeah. Yes. What's kind of fun is to keep kind of going in and seeing how how it kind of uh, what's what's around us and um, you know, the the slopes and the and the soils and stuff you can see the town of Olney every single little village has a little town um, uh, you know a little church a little candlestick maker a little shoemaker a little bread baker and um, small populations really small and then the next town up is Pomard and just to the south is Mantele. And so um, Volnay has uh, also got some other appellations around it. Let's go over here. There's Merceau right there. Um, so the little town of Volnay, quite, quite teeny. We can even go, we can even see some of the the famous names like Domaine uh, d'Angerville. Uh, these d'Angerville wines are highly sought after. There's Boyo, Philip Boyo, um, and they're all neighbors and they just kind of probably all grew up together. Um, and, and you know, they, they take care of each other very well as all boats in Volnay rise um, with, with the tides and uh, we've got Rosignol up here. Uh, now, I think um, if I remember correctly, uh, Boyo is actually, uh, or Bernard Moro is actually outside of Volnay um, for his production. His vineyards are here, but his production is outside of Volnay. So you got the little towns and then up on the hills, uh, and the slopes, that's where the, the monks started seeing better and better quality. The top of the hill, you've got the forests. Um, 
but uh, the quality uh, kind of slips downhill. By the time you get to the bottom of the hill, you've got a lot of erosion, you got thicker soils, you got more water concentration. So somewhere right through here is where you start hitting that premier crew level as you climb the hill and go up in elevation. And it's, there's definitely a, a, a spot where you start hitting some diminishing returns, but it's right about three quarters of the way up each hill that is where the best uh, best route tends to tends to come from. How is the Volnay treating you? It is definitely a more feminine style, a little more elegant, softer, pretty, uh, sometimes a little thinner in color as well. The nose is very subtle, very earth, very, um, as it said in the review, you could really smell those stony features of Volnay. That's kind of sweet, di uh, damp earth, wet forest floor, mushroomy, um, those type of things I think have developed here. Any other comments or observations? Get a lot of raspberry. Raspberry. I have like one third of an ounce to taste. We sold all the kits and sold all the glasses. I, I got to, a little bit. You know, and um, Burgundy is so savory and so uh, subtle. It's not a power a measurement of power at all, um, but uh, you can get some different volume knobs here. And with Volnay, you definitely have a lot of that uh, bright red fruits. And I think it's between cherry, cranberry, um, red raspberry, like you said. Kind of in there um and then the the way it kind of uh the the, the 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 earthiness is a little bit more prominent than the spiciness in volnay let's uh let's continue our journey as we move from volnay to wine number three Now we're going to the Cote de Nuit to Gevry Chambertin. And we're tasting a legend here. This is Dugapi. Dugapi is a really important producer, been identified by a number of wine writers um, as you know, top <clears throat> historic family, a brand you can trust. They use very, they have very old vines. In fact, they have two levels. They have Viavine and Trey Viavine, which I, I learned today. So they have the super old vines that are over 80 years old. And then they have Viavine, which are like 60 to 80. So that's kind of cool. Um, today's example is as an old vine, Gevry number 10. And I'm just going to show you the actual label here. Uh, how well that's holding up but um really classic very very pretty it's 2016 again so we're benefiting from a little bit of time in bottle this wine will probably be at its best around 2026 um 10 years kind of a magic number for a wine like this but um i do uh recollect tasting it when i made the kits and it is drinking really well <clears throat> george you said you're not you, you you've not been a pinot fan and this changes everything that's pretty that's pretty high compliment um is that because of the glass or is that because of the wine itself you can either comment in writing or come on and tell us. Yeah, that uh, 
you don't have one of your glasses. I was one of the last purchasers and the glasses were gone. So I missed out on that. And uh, I'll be honest, I've really not had any um, French Pinots. The Volnay just kind of really blew me away. I was just, I was astonished how good that was. Oh. How many years were in that wine? Uh, versus what I've been trying in America, you know, the, all my friends love Pinot Noir. I think it became a cult thing, but uh, I just didn't get it here. You know, it just didn't make sense to me in the glass. But uh, I'm anxious to try the Chevrolet uh, Chambertin because uh, the Volnay was just amazing. Great. Absolutely amazing. And, uh, yeah, no, uh, no. I have to, I have to stop buying other wines so I can start buying these expensive French ones. <laughs> that is the downside of learning about Burgundy. Burgundy is uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> the, Thank you. The expensive habit. Um, yeah, you can blame me. Maybe you've got some stocks you can sell. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna sell them quick. I'm gonna lose value. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure, sir. Um, yeah. So we. When you think about Burgundy and the number of the top uh, villages that there are, and we are tasting village wines tonight, we had Queenie, we had Volnay, now we're going to go to Gevry Chambertin, and uh, we're tasting some really nice producers. Um, uh, Gevry is is certainly uh, as important as any part of, of Burgundy. It's uh, some people it's their favorite. Um, I will say too, um, there's the Grand Cru Chambertin, which is what uh, uh, Gevry is named after. Um, let's let me just get a little more granular about Gevry Chambertin, and let's show you this here. Why is it all? There we go. Um, here's a nice picture, kind of set the mood as we pull into the town of Gevry Chambertin. That's a, that's a beautiful picture right there. That's a, uh, the Grand Cru. And then there's a Clodebez, a Chambertin Clodebez, which is a Premier Cru. Here's a La, La Trassier, I believe it is, uh, Chambertin. And they're all right next to each other. They're all neighbors. They, they just realized that this was better better ground. And that probably is right after harvest and the vines are exhausted and it's, you know, late, it's probably early November. Um, and uh, the, the, the winemakers are still in the cellars doing their cellar work. Uh, once they're done with that, they'll come out and get the vet, the vineyard ready for the next, the next leaf. South of Dijon uh, by 15 kilometers. Uh, we were in the Cote de Bone for the white and the Volnay. Now we're in the Cote de Nuit. So uh, a, a little more red wine dominated area in the Cote de Nuit. Um, there's pretty good information available for you um, about the different villages. Let's go into my slideshow and take a look at this wine particularly. Um, <clears throat> 92 points, Burghound, Allen Meadows. Um, I do uh, think that most of their wines come off pretty um, hard edged when they first bottle them. They're big, they're, they make them for the long haul. And if you taste them early, they can be a little un, uh, unfriendly, uh, but then you all of a sudden break through to the other side. And that's what I discovered when I opened up wine number three, it had this wonderful um, richness, wonderfully complex nose, beautiful um, example of Gervais Chambertin. Again, they're using very old vines. Here's that story. 65 years is uh, kind of their VA vine. And then they have the tray, uh, tray VA vine, tray old vines, very old vines, over 100 years. 
So I'll be looking for the very old vine, uh, Jevry, in the future. Didn't, I, I don't know if that's something you can even find, but I'll be looking a little harder. Um, and Dude IP is a, you know, on par with some of the best producers in Burgundy. And uh, more of the same, that biodynamics, using the horses, no herbicides, pesticides, all hand labor, uh, beautiful old cellar, wonderful um, uh, uh, vineyard holdings, and they have everything they need to be just the absolute top of the food chain. Uh, they are uh, very important in Jevry Chamartin. They um, have some of the best sites and some of the best, uh, uh, you know, land holdings. And so they do make three, four, five, six hundred dollar bottles. Uh, I'm sure they're going through Chamartin if we took a look. Let's do that. If you've never used Wine Searcher and you wanted to just see what things look like, you could go. You could see Dugapi, and uh, you could search on the producer. You can see all the different wines that they make, and then kind of some of the average prices. Here's a Grand Cru, thousand bucks. Here's a Grand Cru, seven hundred. Uh, this is not Grand Cru; it's two hundred five. Um, <clears throat> the old vines that we're tasting, average price one seventy six. What's my price? One fifty five. I spend a lot of time making sure my prices are, are a little bit better than if I can. Uh, sometimes I I buy wines when I can buy them and you have to kind of buy them and hold them and wait for your price to become good because the lower end prices might be because they bought them on pre-offer. They went over in a, with a container, bought them in Europe using a different currency. It's called gray marketing. There's a lot of different ways people can get wine. Um, I do tend to buy them by the primary importers uh, for my personal store, my, my accounts, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, you can see the prices. Not very much under 200 bucks from this producer. So we're kind of, this is kind of their, I, I do think that they make a simple Bourgogne. Yeah, there it is. $78 for their regular Bourgogne. So that's uh, that's expensive Bourgogne, Bourgogne meaning uh, wine of Burgundy, and um, I do know that they have some other sites outside of Gevry, but I always think of these guys as Gevry Chambertin specialists, and so that's why they, these these prices are are where they're at. All right, let's go back in. What do you think of the uh, of the wine, Thomas? How's the Gevry? I thought they uh, all three wines were just superb, uh, Ian. Um, the Gevry is probably <clears throat> a more. Exp I, I don't drink a lot of Burgundy. It's um, um, I have a long stand loyalty to California producers, but um, I, I do love it. And Gevry Chambertin is probably my my favorite of of the Burgundies. Uh, and this is just superb. Um, loved the Volnay as well, and loved the uh, the the, the Bourgogne as well. So all good. Wish there were more. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, do more. we'll do some more in the future. I, you know, this is, it's good for me too to be able to visit some of these things with you and get your uh, impressions. Um, and uh, you were able to do this, Thomas, with the glass. Did you? Yeah. That yeah. Elegant things for you. Yeah. No, the glasses are great. Um, you know, I, I actually, um, you know, Bedrock Winery, right? They actually use Zalto. If you go to the Hooker House uh, in, in Sonoma, which is great experience, they use Zalto. And it was my first experience with Zalto glasses. I went in and had the wines. And, of course, they were superb in the glass. And, oh, these are great glasses. What are these? Oh, Zalto. And I said, oh, I'm going to go out and get, like, a case of them or something. They're just fantastic. And then I, then I saw the prices. And <laughs> that was a few years ago. And I have yet to, this is my first Zalto glass. To uh -huh. come. These are great classes. They're fantastic. Well, we're doing the same type of program next week with Bordeaux. Yeah. And there is also a, an all-purpose Zalto as well. At some point in the future, um, 
I'll do a program with those. I do have quite a few Bordeaux glasses. Uh, so we probably won't run out of those unless someone gets aggressive. But um, I have them for sale and plan to continue to sell them into the future. Uh, they are incredibly fragile. Um, let's you know, state the obvious. Um, but they, uh, but uh, you know, we 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 are until we start breaking a lot of them. I think we found found the right boxes to ship them in, and that's an important part. Um, don't see my friends outside of the state. Is anyone uh, from New York or other parts of the U.S. on our Zoom tonight? Because I shipped some out of the state, and I wanted to make sure everything arrived in good order. But um, George, where are you located? Yeah, I'm in uh, I'm in Temecula here in California. Okay, great. Okay. Well, um, we did ship them uh, in, in, to some uh, other places, and some of them might be watching us on Facebook or watching uh, this video later. We do provide these videos for you to watch at a later point. If you ever come to a Zoom in the line, maybe you can't get in or having you're late, whatever, just know that we do record these sessions for later viewing. Um, but uh, uh, I'm enjoying doing these with you. It keeps me learning, keeps me growing in, in this world of wine that's ever changing. Um, and this is my first time doing this with Zalto. I hope you found it um, uh, good, but also just the wine tasting. A lot of you were just doing the tasting with me and I hope you guys enjoyed that. Gia, were you tasting with Zalta tonight or just the, the flight? I have the Gabriel glass, which is about half the cost. Okay. So I don't know how it compares. Well, they're both great glasses. So I'll just tell you that it's a wonderful. Okay. That's like the Gabriel is like a, a multi-use glass as well, or is that burgundy? This is a multi-use. They have a crystal, but this is just a plain glass one. Got it. Well, what I want to do before we leave is just show you a couple of things we have coming down the pipe because we have some really cool programs, um, including next week, which I think we actually just opened up a few more. We're, we're going to have a larger group even for Bordeaux next week. Uh, this one was sold out, um, but we're going to go for double the audience for Bordeaux um, because it just didn't have enough burgundy glasses. So if you know anybody who wants to taste along, we're going to taste some great Bordeaux next week. And by the way, there are five wines next week. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to cover a lot of different uh, areas such as Pesec, Pomerol, uh, Margot, Saint-Julien, and saint Steph. Mm -hmm. And we'll do that with the Zalto uh, Bordeaux. Uh, do it with or without the glass for $49. The, the, without the glass is $49. And then if you do it the glass and the flight kit, it's $134. Uh, let's see. After that, um, uh, we are working with, board, with Rioja and we have just an incredible program. Um, and in order to buy the, these programs, we go to our Learn About Wine website. And uh, this is a, a co-production with Learn About Wine and the Rioja region. And we're going to have six different producers on the Zoom with us. Uh, and, and we'll also have a representative from Rioja USA on the Zoom with us. Oh, and so we'll taste through, we'll learn the stories of each of the brands like Muga, like uh, Marquez de Marietta, uh, Cune, uh, La Rioja Alta, Lopez de la Heredia, and then we'll finish again with the Cune, but the Imperial line. And uh, this is a 98 point, 95, 96, 92, 97, 92. So no slouches in the, in the group, really top flight Rioja study. And it's 29 bucks. So I, I, I'm hoping to get 60 people on there for all these producers to see us at our full strength. That's a, that's a sold out event for us. And uh, we're getting pretty close, but we got some work to do. So tell your friends to join us from home for $29. We'll deliver the kit. Um, 
and uh, that would be it'd be great to have a, a sold out event. We we hope that the value uh, gets out there. Um, we also have in the weeks that follow, um, we're going to be doing rosé on the third of May, and the the rosés that I picked are absolutely the best of the best. So we're gonna we're gonna be going from Germany, tasting one of my favorites, mm -hmm. uh, Pinot Noir from Germany. Then we'll go down to Corsica. We'll visit Domaine Ott in Provence. We'll go to Bondal with Tara Brune. We'll head back to California for Tablas Creek and finish with the Maybach family uh, wines. And so these are really a top flight uh, in rosé and, and a really strong uh, value proposition, $35 for the rosé flight. And we continue uh, every Wednesday. Um, in fact, I think some of the Zooms we're, we're, we're working on are pretty sophisticated going out into the future. And, um, and these are just kind of complementing some of the live activities that we're trying to bring online. Uh, but uh, it'll, we'll be entering into warmer months. So we're playing around you know, with some on-time type of presentation. What's the right type of wine for June and July? And we'll, we'll be posting those as well. And uh, we'll probably be having those up by next Wednesday on our calendar. Hmm. So um, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Uh, hopefully you can join us for one of those upcoming programs. It's not too late to join us for Bordeaux if you'd like to join us again. And I uh, thank you guys for joining me tonight. Uh, I did invite Zalto to participate, but they just don't have the bandwidth or the people that do this stuff. There's no uh, Maximilian Riedel out there uh, teaching people about the Zaltos. They kind of let yeah. nature take its course. It's a much smaller company. And um, I'm just eager to get some more Zaltos in my hand. They should be arriving um, in, in the next week or two. Um, so I should have great supply throughout the summer. Uh, so think of me when you're ready for some more Zaltos and I can, I can try to beg, borrow and steal and get more if I need them. Thank you guys very much. I look forward to seeing you. And remember, Merchant of Wine, uh, all the wines that we tasted tonight are available on the website. If you are if you liked any of those, they are considered a very good price and good value. I have, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many total bottles of the Puini, but I have a few. I have a good case and a half of the Volnay and probably two cases of the Gevry. So they'll be here for a while. I took pretty good positions on them in, this, in their in their rifle vintages, um, but they can all disappear in a single day. Sometimes that's kind of what's happened. What happens in internet retail? You think you're in a good spot, and then all of a sudden somebody comes in and takes everything that you had. Um, that, that's when you go back out and try to find something else to fill it's, it that spot. And um, I have fun doing that. Thanks again for hanging out with me. You guys have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks for great tasting, uh, Ian. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good night. Wendy, I'll talk Thank to you, you soon, okay? We'll, we'll talk about okay. Italy. Yay. Okay. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye.